I, I recognize it's, 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 it's Friday afternoon. You've, you've had a whole week of, of listening to economics uh, talks, and I'm sure you're all thinking, wondering yourself, well, uh, I can't wait to listen to uh, what Dr. Patrick Newman has to say. I haven't heard him speak at all this week. So uh, I recognize this is number four, but I, I, I saved the best for last. Uh, so this is, uh, as we're moving through history on Wednesday, I, Freedom Fest, I spoke about the Constitution. Then after I spoke about here um, today at 9 a.m., I spoke about the early American history. And now we'll be speaking about the progressive era of the early 20th century and the new progressive era of the early 20th century. So we're, we're moving through history. Um, so uh, what is this about? Um, I'm going to compare the progressives of the past so of the, of the early 20th century, uh, the Progressive Era, which Murray Rothbard documented so well in his book, The Progressive Era, uh, and their policies with those of today, so the early 20th, uh, 21st century, right? Because we hear a lot about how the, 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 the years, the, the year we're living in now, the, the, the next upcoming decade, the 2020s, is going to be a new Progressive Era, a new great leap forward of all sorts of wonderful things, wonderful policies, a whole new revolution in how the government uh, uh, controls our lives and in, in, in the economy and all sorts of great stuff. And I want to try and show that, well, it, in many ways, it's very similar to what the progressives of the past were trying to do, right? Because we're continually told that, okay, this is progressive, we're moving forward. Uh, in reality, uh, as I'll try and argue, uh, the progressive era of the past, as well as the progressive era of today, is really a regressive era. Like we're going backwards. We're adopting all of the stuff, all of the bad policies that uh, we broke away from. Uh, basically, all new modern forms of mercantilism, uh, etc. So I, I could talk about all the ways in which the progressives of today are similar with the progressives of the past, but that would take uh, a whole week, not just forty-five minutes. So I only am going to concentrate on a couple things. Uh, I want to talk about their similar ideological backgrounds and just uh, other aspects of their backgrounds. Uh, I want to talk about how both progressives uh, are, have been working to cartelize industries to benefit big business, okay? So uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, also want to discuss briefly the progressives' environmental laws um, and their labor laws. And I also want to uh, finish up by uh, talking about how they plan, how they, how they did fund their programs and how the progressives today plan to fund their programs. And uh, it's with taxes. This may come as a surprise. I'm, I'm sort of letting out the big secret now. Uh, draconian taxes in particular. Okay. So who are the progressives of the past? All right. So we think of the individuals, the men and women who were responsible for uh, pushing for all sorts of new laws. Some of these laws I'll briefly talk about later in the presentation. Who were these individuals? Okay. Surprisingly, they came from uh, a very tight background, uh, similar, uh, you know, similar background, uh, as I'll show many of the progressives today uh, uh, come from. Uh, they were Yankees. Okay. So it doesn't mean they supported the Yankees baseball team. Uh, that came later. Yankees really refers to they were descendants of the New England Puritans, okay? Uh, they either stayed in New England or they moved to uh, New York, particularly Western New York, the state, uh, uh, and the Midwest, okay? So it's, it's a certain type of ethnicity, uh, basically comes from New England, all right? Uh, most progressives were Yankees, okay? They also had an evangelical zeal, so they had this, this, this urge to really remake society, uh, initially by coercively uh, stamping out sin, particularly alcohol uh, consumption, okay? So uh, the progressives were pietists, or as Rothbard describes, they were post-millennial pietists. So a post-millennial pietist is someone who tries to bring about the thousand-year kingdom of God uh, before uh, Jesus can return. So in order to do that, you have to get rid of all the impurities in the world. In order to save yourself, you also have to save others, right? So this uh, started off with, you got to uh, crack down on alcohol consumption, Sunday fun, uh, you know, uh, immigration. You got to make sure kids are reading the right Bible in school, uh, et cetera. They commonly clashed with uh, liturgicals, okay? So if the uh, pietists were uh, Methodist and Baptist, et cetera, who wanted to use the government to uh, run society, liturgicals, uh, Catholics, uh, certain Lutherans, et cetera, they said, well, as long as you just stick to the teachings of the church, you can just focus on saving yourself, uh, you'll be good, et cetera. Uh, they continually clashed with those groups, okay? Um, 
They were also intellectuals, right? So they had earned their PhDs in socialist Germany. So under uh, Bismarck's, uh, the Bismarckian socialism, the Second Reich, okay? So that was the area where PhDs were granted. Uh, initially, the United States didn't have PhDs uh, until the late 19th, early 20th century. I don't find it a coincidence that uh, with PhD granting institutions comes more, more socialist policies. It seems to be a correlation that is not merely coincidence. So anyway, all of these uh, pietists, they went to Germany to get their PhDs and they learned how they could uh, regulate the economy, right? Uh, to improve it. Uh, and then they came back to the United States to set up their own PhD programs to try to increase the scope and power of government, et cetera, okay? This is the, transla this is the transition uh, from when they went uh, from post-millennial pietists to sort of a, a more secular uh, angle where they were, became less religious in the sense that they were less trying to focus on saving individual souls and more to improving public welfare. Okay. So this is a resurrection of the old alliance of throne and altar. Right? So the alliance between the king and the church. Right, The king would support the church and in return the, sh the church would basically preach the benefits of the king to the public saying the king is divine, you have to pay taxes to the king because he's an agent of God, et cetera. And then it became, uh, well, you gotta pay taxes because these taxes are going to improve GDP or they're going to improve public welfare, improve public health uh, and all sorts of stuff, right? So it's just a similar, it's just, it's just another agent basically, right? This is why most intellectuals are interventionists because most intellectuals wouldn't be able to survive on the free market. Free market does not really pay for new analyses of, of, of uh, Beowulf or all sorts of other stuff, but a public uh, state school will. So anyway, it's a big surprise. Um, they were also eugenicists. Uh, so they wanted to uh, control and tinker with the labor supply to improve its quality. They basically thought humans were sort of no different than dogs and that could be selectively bred uh, in sort of bad attributes could be very, be very quickly ironed out. So there's a great book that came out uh, by Thomas Leonard a couple years ago called The Liberal Reformers. And it's all about how progressives uh, supported all these policies, minimum wage, uh, immigration restriction, uh, uh, labor laws, et cetera, because they wanted to prevent what they called race suicide. They said all of these immigrants from Eastern Europe, all of these Polish people, all these Italians, uh, you got people from South America, you got the Chinese, you got the Japanese, et cetera. They're all diluting the, 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 the racial stock of the country away from the, the wasp, the, the white Anglo-Saxon Puritan uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, stock. And, and even the women were working when they should be staying home raising children, right? So you read all of these uh, progressives of the past and they're all very strong uh, eugenicists, okay? And in particular, they wanted to use the government uh, to promote uh, eugenics and, 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 and get rid of the, uh, of, of, of the undesirables, so to speak. Okay, um, <clears throat> so the original eugenics was actually a couple of ac some academics in the late 19th century. They wanted to improve the quality of the labor stock. They advocated, uh, well, the government should subsidize, uh, they, they should pay very intelligent people to uh, procreate with other individuals. So basically it became these, ad, ad, these, ad, these academics advocating uh, subsidies directed towards them for them to procreate and there's a very clear special interest uh, problem there. Uh, but anyway, then it became, it switched to a much more nefarious uh, angle. Uh, last but not least, they were bellicose on foreign policy. They didn't just wanna save the United States, they wanted to save the world. This is Wilsonian democracy. Uh, this is, uh, you know, the, the, we need to uh, have bases in Europe. We need to expand into Asia. The progressives were ardent imperialists, and they thought they were better than uh, you know, other countries, and, you know, the United States needed to rule over them, all right? So, say, so, all right, I've gone through a good amount of individuals, uh, but, of course, you know, you want, you want names, right? Uh, so just a, a brief snapshot of, of, of who some of these individuals are. Oh, you got Theodore Roosevelt, okay? Uh, he's the uh, top left. He was a president uh, in the early 1900s. Um, he had a Harvard ed education. He married into the Boston uh, financial oligarchy. Okay, so again, some of that New York, he was from New, uh, New, New England uh, uh, stock. He, he later became governor of, of, of New York. Uh, he was also a prohibitionist. Okay, alcohol consumption was bad. When he was initially police chief of New York City, he enforced the Reigns Law, which cracked down on Sunday liquor consumption uh, and the selling of liquor. 
right? So progressives were very anti-fun on Sunday, right? Uh, the great progressive fear, uh, the great pietist fear, as H.L. Mencken once said, was that somewhere someone is having fun, okay? And that was the progressives were trying to stamp that out. Um, he was also a militarist. So uh, the Rough Riders in the Spanish-American War, he was an ardent imperialist. Uh, he eagerly uh, advocated us basically ruling over other people uh, across the world. You have Harvey Washington Wiley. Uh, he's on the top right. He was the main chemist uh, behind the 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act. Okay? Similar background as most other progressives. He was the son of a pietist preacher, uh, and he grew up with a lifelong obsession with purity. Certain foods were, were sinful, were bad. Now, what's kind of odd about this is that he was, he was ardently pro-sugar. Okay. He was connected with many sh sugar interests, which is why he was pro-sugar. Uh, but so somehow sugar wasn't sinful or bad for you. So he would attack saccharin, uh, but he would be pro-sugar. And he had, he had many lines. He said, childhood without candy would be like, would be heaven without harps. Okay. So he, was, <laughs> he wanted kids to eat candy. Again, I kind of find this odd because he's in charge of our nation's public health. Uh, but anyway, he studied at the University of per Berlin. Okay. So again, you got that German background. He was an imperialist. He was pro-annexing Hawaii, uh, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines, okay? Last but not least, uh, we've got Richard T. Eli. Uh, he was the main founder behind the intensely pietist and interventionist American Economic Association, all right? This Association of Economists, which is still around, was explicitly designed to be anti-laissez-faire. And many of its initial uh, founders were uh, directly linked with the social gospel movement uh, of the past. Okay, he was the son of an extreme pietist farmer. Uh, he got a PhD from Germany. Uh, he was a staunch eugenicist. He's pro minimum wage. So Eli, along with many other progressive economists, said that well, we need to raise the minimum wage because this will explicitly unemploy uh, immigrants, people who have lower marginal value products, marginal revenue products. Right. So this is a blatant uh, interventionist economist, sort of the model uh, progressive economist. Okay. And usually in, in history books, when these guys are discussed, uh, a lot of the, the nasty details are sort of covered up. Uh, when they are, they're always, it's always sort of a, you know, just uh, dismissed away, right? None of these are ever big problems if they, if they support intervention, et cetera. It's only the, the free market individuals of the past uh, that all of their uh, views are held up to extreme scrutiny. Okay. So, with that being said, now we can compare them, uh, these individuals or the, the general classification uh, analysis of progressives uh, of the past with progressives of today, right? So who are the progressives of today, the, the, the individuals in control of our lives now, right? Well, they're not necessarily Yankee, uh, but they do live in Yankee regions, we could say. So they predominantly live in New England, right? If you think about the major, the, the Ivy Leagues, uh, the center of a lot of intellectual life. So we'll be talking about uh, that's in New England, as well as the major coastal cities. So you've got New York City uh, for finance, Washington, D.C. for politics, San Francisco for big tech, Los Angeles for media, et cetera. Right? The, uh, the rest of the, the country is so-called flyover country. Right, there's Chicago and maybe a city somewhere else, but everywhere else is just kind of irrelevant. Right? There's also Miami, too. Right? You can go down there and have fun. Uh, but it's just the rest of the country is just sort of this, this rural place that you can see when you're, when you're flying uh, in, in a plane. Okay. Um, they are social justice warriors, as we all know. They're not religious traditionally. Right? In fact, they're often uh, explicitly atheist, but they are crusaders for egalitarianism and other initiatives. So they have that same desire, that, that drive to really remake society and to, so to stamp out sin, right, uh, so to speak. Right? By you know, racism, sexism, et cetera, all these problems in the world, they're, all, they're, they're finding them and they're all, they're all pointing to one ultimate cause, and it's the worst ism of all, capitalism. So they're saying all of, the, all of mankind's social ills, everything from global warming to uh, discrimination to uh, viruses to et cetera, is all due to the, the profit-making uh, motive you know, all in, in, in private property, et cetera. Right? I'm not telling you anything uh, you, you don't already know. We've all, we, we've, we've all seen this time and time again. Uh, they are intellectual, so they're heavily educated. 
uh, usually at Ivy League universities and other prestigious universities. This includes University of Chicago, the uh, elite uh, California schools on the West Coast, and so on. Um, and they also want other people to be educated, but not as educated as them, right? So we all go, we have to go to the, the, the schools beneath them, right? So you, you hear about this now, or, you know, before everyone needed to graduate high school, now everybody needs to get an undergrad degree. Uh, the phrase, as an educator myself, I hear about K through 20 more and more, where now the, for the beginning of college is supposed to transition students from high school into college, and now the dividing line has to be a master's degree, right? So we're moving from everyone has to have a high school degree to everyone has to have an undergrad degree to everyone has to have a master's degree. Eventually, in 10 years, I'll be giving this talk, and everyone will be uh, you know, getting a PhD, et cetera. Um, you know, we'll be just like the Soviet Union. Uh, everyone's got PhDs and all sorts of things. Um, they are, they are <laughs> they're social uh, engineers. They're elitists that want to mold society. Okay, they want to uh, shape uh, people's ideas. They want to get rid of certain undesirable behavior, right? Toxic masculinity. So now uh, our, 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 our razors, um, you know, have to have to, you know, they're going to tell us uh, how we should behave. Uh, certain bad behavior needs to be canceled, uh, etc. Right? Everyone else can be molded, but the progressives are the rulers, right? We're just the ruled. Right, so so they there, there can be exceptions made for them. If you if you uh, kiss up to the right people, et cetera, well, you can get away with certain bad behavior, but everyone else uh, can't. Okay, and that's uh, their main uh, drive, you could say, uh, along the cultural front. Uh, they're cultural imperialists. They're going to get rid of all the other cultures except their own. All right, and the last but certainly not least, they are globalists. Right, so these men and women are foreign interventionists. They want America to play a leading uh, role in world affairs. So if you think about the neoconservatism of uh, George W. Bush uh, and many Republicans, it's really just a variant of progressivism. Right, because these individuals are, are, are more or less just big government, just like the progressives. All right, maybe not in certain areas or they want to have to give certain tax cuts, et cetera. But it's really just about using our military to promote the right values abroad, to rule over other countries, to tell them how they should govern themselves, uh, so on and so forth. Okay, so the, the American empire uh, is alive and well among progressives, right? America should play a leading role, uh, should subsidize Europe, uh, should play a role in Asia, et cetera, so on and so forth, okay? But what I now want to do is uh, analyze the particular types of policies progressives of the past pushed for, as well as progressives of uh, the future, right? So this is going to be uh, partially looking at some of the prior government laws of the past, and I want to try and spend more time on the current laws that have already been passed, uh, as well as in the future, with particular emphasis on uh, 2020 and beyond, so the, 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 the COVID crisis, okay? So progressives... Uh, wanted to cartelize industry. So when we think about cartelizing industry, they uh, wanted to basically create government-run uh, agencies that would enforce uh, the pricing and production decisions of businesses. So they wanted businesses to group together, restrict supply, and raise price. Right? On the free market, you can't do that because of competition. So that's why any cartel that lasts, uh, to the extent it lasts at all, has to be propped up with government intervention. Okay. So the progressives uh, passed a whole uh, you know, tedious laundry list of various regulations. They resurrected the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890, the Elkins Anti-Rebating Act of 1903 regarding railroads, the Hepburn Act, uh, Meat Inspection Act, Pure Food and Drug Act, Federal Reserve Act, Federal Trade Commission, etc. Okay. So all of these laws restricted uh, price and product competition. Okay. So just go through a brief example, we've got rebating. Rebating was a way businesses competed with one another by offering uh, discounts to their customers that bought more. Okay? This is no different than the fact that you go to a grocery store, you have to buy a loaf of bread, it costs X amount of dollars. If a restaurant is buying uh, bread from a wholesaler grocery store, they're going to get it at a cheaper amount. Why? Because they're buying more. Okay, This is basic economics, uh, this is a way businesses compete, but uh, businesses got tired of doing this, okay? So they got the government to outlaw these rebates, okay? That railroads were granted to shippers uh, and so on, okay? Uh, they also got rid of product competition by cracking down on so-called adulteration, which is when you would change 
uh, the composition of food. So you might add additional meat into some sort of sausage to improve its flavor or some grain or ice or whatever. And they would say, well, this is, this is an impurity. Again, you got to think about like, what would Harvey Washington Wiley say, right? And this is bad. We need to, we need to get rid of this, et cetera. Uh, this is just a form of competition. And big businesses supported these laws because they weakened free market forces, the internal, uh, the constant c competitive pressures inherent in the business uh, in the business world, and because it would sort of stop more hostile regulation from socialists. Right. So they're trying to block out cap capitalism and communism for that middle of the road uh, way, so to speak. Okay. In these laws, of course, they raise compliance costs on newer and smaller businesses. And this promoted big business at the expense of small business. Now, when you read about this in your traditional uh, American history course, you're not going to hear that at all. You're going to hear the opposite. Oh, these are against big businesses, fought these, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but instead, our, our wise politicians uh, switched to um, uh, laws that would improve the public welfare. Okay. So progressives cartelizing industry uh, now, I know this has been discussed, uh, we've got big tech, so the, the large companies, uh, Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, et cetera, they all support increased regulation all right, over their companies as well as other uh, companies, social media companies, et cetera. Uh, they want to stop the passage of harmful legislation, uh, and they also want to hurt smaller competitors. Right? So newer social media sites such as Odyssey, Rumbler, uh, Rumble, uh, Parler, uh, et cetera, this is a great um, screenshot of an article that came out about a year ago uh, in the Wall Street Journal. It says, tech giants, new appeal to governments, please regulate us, okay? And at the bottom, there's a quote, there's no question in my mind that artificial intelligence needs to be regulated. Alphabet, which is in charge of Google, CEO uh, Sundar Pichai uh, said in early January, the question is how best to approach this, right? And how best to approach it is the way the large companies want to approach it. I mean, that's... That's fairly obvious. Of course, he's not going to say that. He's going to speak in a much more uh, uh, grandiose uh, language. So how exactly are these laws going to hurt smaller competitors? Okay. Well, I think it's very revealing uh, when you have uh, Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg saying, quote, we don't want private companies uh, making so many decisions about how to balance social equities without a more democratic process. Doesn't that just sound great? You know, he just sounds like such a nice guy. He's looking out for you and me. Uh, particularly after 2016. Uh, and so he's saying, what is fair and democratic? Or when you really think about it, he's saying, well, what the government and the business is lobbying it decides. Okay? So the large companies are going to be doing everything fair and democratic, but it's the other companies that are not going to be doing things fair and democratic. Just like the large companies of the past, well, they didn't adulterate their products. right? It's just the, the, the small companies. They're the ones doing everything bad. Okay. Well, it's very clear that the government would play winners and losers, and the expensive artificial intelligence and the platform requirements would impose compliance costs that would hurt these smaller uh, social media companies. Okay. So that's why they really want this stuff, to consolidate their uh, monopoly uh, positions, positions they've gotten through government intervention and lucrative uh, government subsidies, uh, such as from the military, et cetera. I also find it uh, important to note that in the current administration, there's certainly a friendly forum. All right, uh, Kamala Harris, uh, current vice president, uh, has many close ties to big tech. Okay, big tech has funded her uh, previous elections in California. Uh, a uh, former senior counsel is an Amazon lobbyist. Okay, so again, one of the uh, major uh, e-commerce giants. Her first campaign manager now works for Google. Her brother-in-law is a chief legal officer uh, for Uber, uh, et cetera. Okay, so these companies have invested well in her. So when, you know, if, if she's in a position where uh, she can exercise influence on this, uh, in this regard, uh, she's going to push for policies that will block out more hostile legislation uh, for more hardcore socialists and really hurt uh, big tech's competitors. Okay, you're going to invest your money where it will do the most good for you as a, as a large business. It's just like the uh, progressives of the past. Okay, so progressives then, as well as progressives now, uh, want to cartelize industry. They also support these costly environmental laws. Okay, so uh, these laws of the past, progressives, they had channeled taxpayer subsidies into the research and development of irrigation while restricting the use of timber. So they didn't complain about global warming 100 years ago, but they said, well, we're using too many of our resources uh, too fast. Uh, we need to stop this and we need to promote 
more eco-friendly uh, uh, lines of uh, production, right? Irrigation, which supposedly is. Uh, now, this encouraged all these subsidies, encouraged the uneconomic development of irrigation in settlement out in the West, right? So that's why sometimes a lot of times you just see these towns out like the middle of nowhere, and you're like, how did this get there? And you go like, well, that was federal subsidies, you know, for, for irrigation or, or, or some other um, uh, law. Uh, the restriction in the use of timber, so making uh, all of these national parks and blocking off uh, lumber companies from uh, chopping down trees in certain areas, et cetera, this benefited land speculators and railroads. Why? Because then they could sell their uh, trees at higher prices. It's no coincidence that the major financial backers behind all of these timber laws and regulations were the railroads, okay? Because they knew that their property wouldn't be affected. It would just be other property outside of their control. And uh, the progressives were able to realize this through various laws and regulatory agencies, the Bureau of Forestry, the Reclamation Act, the Public Lands and Inlands Waterlands, Waterways Commission, excuse me, uh, of the early uh, 1900s, okay? So all of these environmental laws, uh, were pushed by the progressives. This is all under the uh, the mantra of uh, you know conservation, uh, et cetera. Okay. Well, as as we know, uh, it, progressives today are uh, strong environmentalists. Uh, you've got the 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 new the the Green New Deal, right? Which is gargantuan program estimated by some the cost over ten years, ninety three trillion dollars. Okay, uh, that's a lot. Um, uh, you know, again, uh, I cannot stress how much that is uh, and how much that would hurt the economy. Um, and this is this is this is in real terms, so it's not in nominal terms after inflation or whatever. Uh, and this would restrict the use of fossil fuels and subsidize eco-friendly sources. Uh, AOC, the famous Congress congressman from New York City, is 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 prominent behind these, saying, "Well, we've got to save the planet, and in order to do so, we have to push for all of these laws, getting rid of fossil fuels." and getting rid of our ability to eat cows and, and, and all sorts of other stuff. Um, now, we're not there yet, all right? Many progressives, they've been pushing for these laws, and in the current uh, regime, you're instead only getting a more moderate approach, right? And you get progressives, they're sometimes upset about this. They're saying, oh, well, this isn't enough. But this is just classic strategy, right? Because you get the opening wedge, Right? You get your foot in the door, so to speak, by pushing for a moderate environmental program, because then a couple years down the line, you'll be able to get uh, what you want. Okay, So you sometimes will advance radical legislation by just continually pushing for more, mo just more and more moderate. It's not like once you, you, know, you, you pass this, you say, oh, all right, well, we get this infrastructure bill passed and this environmental law passed. You know, that will satisfy them. Like Now we'll be good. No, it's just going to be the next congressional cycle, so to speak. Biden's proposed infrastructure spending bill, which is as of April about you know two and a half trillion dollars, uh, certainly contains enough of this opening wedge. Uh, you know, half of the proposal is, is really just a plan to reduce CO two emissions uh, through energy efficient homes, public housing, carbon free energy grid, et cetera. Right, uh, all under the guise, well, you know, we got to do all this stuff, uh, particularly the United States. Uh, you know, we ha we have to cut down on all of our emissions. And it's interesting to note, just like big business was behind environmental laws of the past, big business uh, is certainly behind the environmental laws of the present. Uh, hedge funds and tech companies are, are very big uh, green energy investors, okay? So they're saying, yeah, well, we support all of this because uh, if you want to have solar panels on every house, well, there's got to be, there's going to be companies making these solar panels, et cetera, and those are going to be the companies we will uh, invest in, Okay. Of course, that's not really discussed so much. So if businesses are doing that, that's just their altruism, right? They're just generous, unlike all of us greedy individuals. Um, you've got expensive labor laws, all right? So uh, progressives of the past pushed for uh, very uh, expensive uh, labor laws, uh, such as compulsory workmen's compensation laws, right? These... Uh, provided for a system of disability insurance, which we'll talk about, in the Federal Employees Compensation Act of 1916. Okay, so the progressives wanted to. They said, "Well, the the labor markets are imperfect. We have to uh, push for all sorts of new policies that are going to revolutionize how the uh, how bosses uh, deal with their uh, their workers, how the employer deals with the employees, etc." So these workman compensation laws. 
of a worker got injured on the job, well, there would be a, a mandatory uh, uh, insurance fund that would basically pay out for their injury, okay? Bear in mind, before these laws, it, injuries and accidents were going down as a result not of progressive legislation, but because of greater technical, uh, uh, greater technology, more savings that was leading to safer mines, safer factories, et cetera, right? That downward trend never gets discussed. You would think there was just as many kids uh, working in sweatshops in 1909 as there were in uh, 1809, okay? And these laws uh, were promoted uh, by big business. Why? Because they already had their own uh, compensation programs. And they, these laws forced businesses uh, as well as taxpayers to cough up funds for worker welfare uh, and disability insurance. And this raised compliance costs on small businesses. They are now forced to uh, keep track of these programs. They had to hire uh, accountants and, and other sorts of individuals, as well as just the whole apparatus of keeping them up and running. Right, and these laws are sort of the opening wedge to a much more uh, nefarious labor law, in my view, which is the Social Security Act of 1935. Right, which is the program libertarians know and love because it's it's never gone insolvent uh, and it'll always continue to earn enough money. I'm being completely sarcastic here. Uh, it's 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 continually headed towards bankruptcy, uh, and it's been it's been near insolvent before. Uh, this law required companies to uh, basically set up retirement programs for workers, um, businesses, and the workers would have to pay a payroll tax, okay? A uh, payroll tax that would supposedly never have to be raised in the future, et cetera. Uh, and the government would have surpluses after surpluses uh, for the future. No surprise that uh, big business supported this program because it would raise compliance costs on smaller businesses, whereas smaller businesses viciously fought the adoption of Social Security, particularly under the National Association of Manufacturers. Okay, so again, these are some of the revolutionary uh, labor laws of the past, right? Um, well, what are some of the revolutionary labor laws of the future, okay? Uh, well, we hear about this a lot continually, the, the, the specter of technological unemployment, which, bear in mind, has always been a problem. People were saying in the 1950s and 60s, machines were going to take over. People were saying in the 1980s, computers were going to take over. Now people are saying artificial intelligence is going to take over. Everyone, of course, ignores the fact that, well, uh, declining uh, work uh, was actually a, pro a sign of progress right? Uh, machinery, automation increases real income. This lowers prices uh, of goods and it creates new jobs, right? Uh, your parents or my parents, when they were growing up in kindergarten in the 1960s, uh, the education system prepared them for jobs that were not going to be around uh, when they were working in the 1990s and 2000s, just like today, right? It's the same thing, but people always say this time is different, blah, 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 right? Uh, so now we hear, well, in, in the face of this massive... Um, a uh, burst of unemployment that's coming, we need to have universal basic income of say $12,000 a year. So that's about $1,000 a month. Uh, politician Andrew Yang uh, from New York is, is, a, is a very ardent proponent of this, saying that, well, people, everyone should be entitled uh, to $12,000 uh, so they can not work and they can pursue their hobbies and everything. And we live in a post-scarcity world, so this is gonna be great. Well, we're not there yet, but you know, we're certainly making progress to it, unfortunately, right? Uh, we know that during COVID, there was all sorts of stimulus checks and very uh, generous unemployment benefits uh, provided. So uh, last year in March of 2020, there was the CARES Act. Uh, it was about a $2 trillion stimulus package, which included $1,200 stimulus checks for individuals in certain income brackets, as well as $600 in extra unemployment benefits for a certain period of time. Uh, then at the end of the Trump administration in December 2020, you have the Consolidated Appropriations Act, another $600 check, $300 unemployment benefits in the last, well, not really last, probably not last, uh, and, and certainly not least, uh, you have the American Re uh, Rescue Plan Act of March 2021, which is $1,400 uh, stimulus checks to certain individuals and $300 unemployment benefits. So if you've received this money, this is, this is about, you know, again, it, 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 it's, it's several thousand dollars uh, that the government has just provided to you. And that's excluding whether or not you're collecting unemployment benefits, 
Okay, so this is kind of the beginning of the stimulus checks because now the public is going to expect some form of stimulus each year. So like, where's my stimulus check? You know, where are my where are my Biden bucks, so to speak? Okay, uh, and then this is going to be okay. What's going to happen? And similar to Social Security of the past, where politicians would vote on granting Social Security payments right before an election, you're going to probably see, uh, again, additional pressure for stimulus checks before an election to benefit incumbents in power. The unemployment benefits, uh, if you're paying people not to work, they're not going to work. Right? It's just like if you tax something, you're going to get less of it. If you incentivize something, you're going to get more of it. This is basic economic logic, which is probably why it's so hard for various people uh, to understand. OK, and that if you're paying people not to work, they're not going to work. And then the rest of us are going to have to wait a long time to order food at a restaurant uh, or get something done at a basic service industry. This is not criticizing the individuals doing this. They're just following uh, the money, so to speak. Uh, it's criticizing the politicians. Uh, this is a great little chart uh, showing the spike in the number of people on various forms of unemployment benefits. And it's a surprise to various individuals that, you know, the job market, the labor market has recovered more sluggishly. People are uh, not uh, taking as many jobs as, uh, as, as we thought. They're looking for higher uh, benefits. Uh, the decline in people on these programs has, is decreasing, but again, it's at a relatively uh, slower pace than many envision. Okay? And this is the consequences of what would happen if we actually adopted a full-on universal basic income. Right. Many businesses would be forced out of it, you know, uh, you know, forced to go bankrupt because they could not compete. Right. Large businesses could get away with paying their workers more, but many small businesses could not. Uh, they would be uh, forced to pay for expensive automation or, 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 or uh, pay more for workers, et cetera. Uh, and this is going to result in higher prices and reduced production for all of us. Okay. The market can bring us towards uh, nirvana, so to speak. We'll never get there. But if we try and speed it up uh, through government intervention, we're not going to get uh, closer. We're just going to go backwards. Okay. So this, to me, is sometimes the most astounding thing is that uh, we see it all the time when we go order stuff, et cetera. And, 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 and some people are like, no, it's not due to the unemployment benefits. I think now it's sort of being grudgingly admitted. It's like, yeah, maybe pay paying people not to work. Yeah, that, that could possibly, partially, maybe be, cause people not to uh, take jobs. And you're like, all right, that's progress. Uh, we're, we're getting there, uh, at least in terms of greater economic knowledge, uh, but I'm not sure at what pace. Okay. Last but not least, we've got draconian taxes. So this is what, you know, this is, this is what every progressive loves, right? It's to raise taxes on other people. Um, in the past, you had the corporate income tax of 1909, which was legally considered an excise tax, right? So it was like, well, corporations uh, on all income over a certain amount, just for the privilege of operating a corporation, you have to pay uh, a tax. This was initially uh, 1%. Right on all business income over five thousand dollars. Okay, back then five thousand dollars was actually a pretty decent amount. Right, so it was actually on the just on on, on relatively wealthy corporations, and it's a small amount, one percent. Okay, then you had the Sixteenth Amendment of nineteen thirteen. This legalized the income tax. Right uh, before an income tax was unconstitutional, uh, it was made constitutional, and the highest bracket was uh, seven percent. Okay, again, on the top. So uh, that's not a whole lot. And this is what usually happens when taxes are advocated. They say, well, it's only going to be on certain individuals uh, who are making a lot of money and the amounts are going to be that high. Trust me, right? That's what usually happens. But of course, give it a couple of years, if not a decade, the rates are going to go up, right? To pay for World War I, taxes rose, including on the less rich, the middle class were paying income taxes in World War I. Uh, by the late 1920s, the corporate income tax was 11% in the highest bracket for the uh, personal income tax was 25%. Okay? So they were higher during the war, but then they were cut in the 1920s, but they were, they were never cut back down to their original level. Okay? So what's the lesson here? The lesson is the severity and scope of taxes always goes up. Right? Because after this, in the Great Depression, taxes rose on the middle class, including the payroll tax I mentioned before, and in World War II, etc., Right. So initially, it's always advocated saying, oh, the rich are only going to pay this tax. But then what happens, given enough time, the middle class, the less rich, even the poor, et cetera, et cetera, will pay a tax. Okay. Well, we can see this now. 
uh, with uh, the new taxes progressives are advocating, all right, we can start off with a wealth tax, right? So progressives advocate uh, wealth taxes on the rich. Uh, most prominently, you've got Senator Elizabeth Warren, who says, well, we need a 2% wealth tax on a net worth of greater than 50 million, a uh, 3% tax on net worth greater than 1 billion. Okay, so this is this is on individuals who are making a lot of money, such as me. Uh, this is an incredible. I'm, I'm just joking. I don't make anywhere near uh, 50 million. It's more like 40 million. But anyway, so I'm safe for now. Um, and they say, well, you know, Warren's even championing. Well, you got to impose an exit tax so on rich people who leave the country and they move their wealth out. The government's going to uh, hit them on their way out, and they're going to collect like a 40 percent. Uh, some, something, something ridiculous like that. So it's, it's a very, very draconian tax. Um, th these taxes are not going to remain only on the rich. Uh, they're going to spread, uh, given enough years, uh, on uh, less rich people and on the middle class. Because in order to fund all of these expensive programs, uh, middle, the middle class has to pay. The middle class uh, finances Social Security. Right? It's not on the uber rich. Again, most people, most progressives just say, well, the rich can pay for everything. Uh, we divide the, the amount of money Jeff Bezos has, and we, you know, we take the current price of, of a car. Everyone could get a new car, et cetera, and the, 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 it's just, that's just completely wrong, uh, et cetera, but that hasn't stopped anyone uh, from, changing, uh, from changing their math. Uh, interestingly enough, this is one of the most fascinating proposals. Uh, this is more recent is uh, Biden uh, and the Secretary of the Treasury, Janet Yellen, they want to raise the corporate income tax to 28%. Right? So President Trump cut it from about 35% to 21%. Uh, Biden wants to raise it up back to uh, 28%. Our corporate income tax used to be very high uh, relative to other nations, including for things like deductions, exemptions, et cetera, uh, which made our businesses uh, less competitive. So what's fascinating is that Biden and uh, his uh, Secretary of the Treasury, Janet Yellen, who's a former uh, chair of the Federal Reserve, they, they recognize this. They say, well, if we want to pay for our infrastructure uh, programs and all sorts of other stuff, we're going to have to raise taxes, but this will make uh, U.S. businesses less competitive. Oh, I know the solution. Why don't we get the rest of the world to raise their corporate income tax? Just like any sort of cartelizing progressive, right? You recognize, well, you've got to get everyone involved to prevent the external competition. So Biden and Yellen are pushing for uh, the rest of the world to adopt a 21% uh, minimum corporate income tax, okay? And uh, they would enforce this by basically companies that aren't complying. They would then, uh, for, for countries that aren't complying, excuse me, they would get rid of various exemptions uh, et cetera, aka they would raise taxes on their country, on their companies operating the United States, right? So if some Eastern European country refuses to comply, well, uh, their, uh, that country's companies are uh, going to face increased uh, pressure in the United States. And this is very clearly to reduce competitive disadvantages from higher U U.S. corporate income tax, okay? This is, this, this is extremely blatant. This is the, 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 the anti-competitive uh, you know, uh, just uh, animus of uh, most progressives, all right? You're trying to weaken your competition, okay? All right. So we're conclusion, we're out here. I, I, I know, it's been, it's been a long day. Uh, today's progressives are very similar to yesteryear's uh, progressives. The policies of the past created a regressive era. The policies proposed now uh, would do the same. Uh, you haven't done so, you should buy Murray Rothbard's progressive era, uh, which uh, it was edited by a, a uh, it was edited by me, um, and <laughs> uh, uh, so you, you should buy it not just for that, but because it's a great book. Uh, and you should also read my Mises Institute articles. Uh, are we on the cusp of a new progressive era? Uh, and is Kamala Harris the 21st century Woodrow Wilson? Uh, with that, I think I will conclude. So thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed my presentation. <laughs>